tonight, Marie-Julie Jaény. You are in for a treat. Marie-Julie Jaény and the apparitions of La Fraude are one of the most extraordinary visions and or apparitions for end times, so stay tuned. Hello everyone, tonight we have a special treat for you. We are beginning a series of episodes on La Fraude. La Fraude is the little hamlet where Marie-Julie Jaini received her apparitions from the Lord. And what a, an extraordinary um, set of apparitions that was. There are over 120,000 pages of transcripts on these apparitions. So we have a lot to discuss tonight. So tonight we are starting with um, the phenomena surrounding Marie-Julie Jaini. And we have with us tonight, once again, Xavier reyes Eral. Xavier, it's so nice to have you back. Good evening, Monique. How are you? And thank Very you for joining. Thank you. So, Xavier, tonight uh, we're going to be discussing how Marie-Julie Jaini was a victim soul. Can you tell us a bit, what is a victim soul? Yes, that's a very good point. Um, a victim soul is a soul that is approached by heaven, either through the Holy Spirit, through our Lord Jesus Christ, and or through the Blessed Virgin Mary, to ask or invite that particular soul uh, whether or not he or she would be ready, willing, and able um, to suffer for the conversion of sinners, for the conversion of humanity, or for a particular country. And that is uh, what, are you, uh, what is uh, this kind of uh, um, soul uh, is called to, to do. And um, in La Salette, which was the last chapter we've covered, the Virgin Mary, uh, remarkably enough, um, mentioned to uh, Melanie and uh, Giraud uh, and Maxima Giraud that there was no victim souls that were willing to sacrifice themselves for the conversion of uh, of sinners that is to say until a couple of decades later for marie julie Jani. amazing and so so can you give us a bit of a context um a historical context perhaps as to when these apparitions happened what was happening in, in society at the time and what when you know when were there other apparitions happening at the time yes uh the apparitions the true or rather the cornerstones of uh, the experiences that Marie-Julie Jani uh, started to uh, experience were beginning in 1873, somewhat sometimes after the Franco-Prussian War. You know? And uh, they continued on forward um, about uh, all the way to 1941. So in between 1873 and 1941, um, the era, the contemporary era, historically speaking, involved the annunciation of the First World War, the beginning of uh, uh, the laws of laïcité in France, the separation of state and church, uh, the prediction of uh, the um, Second World War, the Treaty of Versailles, the Second World War, the, um, afterwards about the events that were to, to follow up uh, the First and the Second World Conflict such as the liberation of Algeria, the freedom and the decompose, uh, decomposure of the French and British Empire, and yet more uh, events in the future which are yet to come. Um, in regard to the context of this time, it is important, and I will be very brief on the subject, to remember that none of these apparitions, none of these revelations given privately or publicly uh, cannot add anything at all that has already been given through the Holy Gospels, uh, particularly um, through even from the moment the last, the very last apostle passed away. That was it. That was the final dot on the Gospels, on the teachings of heaven, 
through Christ for his followers. These particular apparitions very much like Marie-Julie Janie, La Salette, which we talked to these past two weeks, and those that are yet to be discussed, have only one and only one mission. And that is to echo what the Virgin Mary said um, 2,000 years ago, and that is, do what my son tells you, convert. And we'll go into that as we proceed forward. <laughs> okay. And so these apparitions were approved by the church before we uh, we have anyone thinking oh, this is way too sensationalist, sensationalistic. This is these apparitions were investigated. They were approved by the church, correct? Well, in yes, uh, very informally though, and by the church, you should say by the local bishop, by Monseigneur Fournier, who in June of 1876, if memory serves. Uh, wrote a statement declaring that indeed he recognizes the case uh, of Marie-Julie Janie as being supernatural, coming from God and bringing forth a message for humanity. As a matter of fact, I have here uh, the English translation of the statement that he wrote to Dr. Humbert, who was at the time uh, appointed by the same bishop, Monsignor Fournier, bishop of the city of Nantes, jurisdiction over La Fraude and the uh, little village of Blain, uh, and therefore on the case at hand. And he stated, uh, open quotes, the report that I receive daily on Marie-Julie Janie shows me more and more the actions of God on this soul. He grants her graces of an obvious supernatural order. At the same time, she grows in virtue and noble sentiments. The natural and human disappear in her, and she often speaks to people she sees or who are referred to her, giving instructions which are not in keeping with a normal state. She's sincere. What she manifests is supernatural. I see nothing but good, edifying and in conformity with the principles of spirituality. Therefore, it is God who favors her. Written and signed formally by Monsignor Fournier, Bishop of Nantes, on June the 6th, 1875. I was off by one year. It's so nice so that she, she is yeah. one, she's one of few uh, visionaries who had the support of her bishop pretty early on, didn't she? Yes. And uh, it, when it all began in uh, rather two years earlier, um, Monsignor Fournier was very suspicious. It all began when she began to receive um, uh, all these apparitions in 1873. Remarkably enough, uh, Monique, she began to receive the stigmata, but not just any stigmata. She received them all. The Catholic Church, some even uh, Catholic authorities, state that of all the um, stigmatists in the history of the Roman Catholic Church, None surpasses that of Marie-Julie Janie. It was extraordinary. Monique, imagine she had the crown, the nails on her hands coming out of nowhere, her feet, her side, even a particular stigmata on her chest that stated with letters, O crux ave, which in Latin states, O hell to the cross. And what's more, to show the poetry, the love of God. She all this appeared in her person while exuding a remarkable fragrance of fresh morning roses. Extraordinary. Now, this, if this is not a proof that God is the greatest of artists, of poets, of fathers, I do not know what it is. <laughs> she, um, she mentioned, she was asked about receiving the stigmata. Do you want to tell us a bit what she said about it, how it came about? Quite. I took the liberty to make notes. This, of, in my book, is the chapter that's the largest of it all. And between you and I, I will tell you a secret that I hope nobody will know. But this is my very favorite mm -hmm. chapter of all. In this particular instance, oh. indeed. Becky, we can't uh, hear you. Becky, we can't oh, hear you. You... Mm -hmm. Terribly sorry. Terribly sorry. There was a phone call from 
although it's very late in France, but somebody's calling me. I beg your pardon. This is a live show. So I'm sure that your telespectators will be indulgent. As I it's said, all good. <laughs> our, um, remarkably enough, our Lord and the Blessed Virgin Mary always announced or forewarned all the events that she was about to experience. And that included the uh, stigmata. And also, as a victim soul, which you very rightfully pointed out, everything was told in advance for her to be able to prepare emotionally. Although she knew what was coming, and she took it, embraced uh, these events with utter and sheer love. Because if anything can be said of Marie-Julie Jani, is that this young woman was consumed, not just for the love of God, of the Blessed Virgin Mary of Heaven, but she was a tremendous patriot. She loved France, the history of France, Louis the Ninth, called Saint Louis, Saint Jean d'Arc, Saint Joan of Arc. For her, those things are, for not just for her, for every little boy, every little girl who learns since the age of five of the old French knights fighting for the glory of the kingdom, for the glory of God. There are songs that are sung across the Atlantic in different languages that talk of those histories of past year, of yesteryears, that must not, that will not be forgotten. And Marie-Julie Janie was one of those uh, little girls who grew up with the passion of France, the passion of the memory of sacrifices of yesteryears, of a country which was called, to this day, the Church's eldest daughter. So yes, she was forewarned and uh, she was prepared. And I'll ask you again your indulgence because there are so much information I want to make sure that I do not make mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> so she said, okay, so she mentioned in the, uh, and you pointed it out in the book, she had a beautiful quote here. She said, when I received the stigmata, our Lord appeared to me with radiant wounds. It was as if a sun surrounded them. A luminous ray came out of each wound and struck my hands, feet, and side. At each at the end of each ray, there was a drop of red blood. The ray that left the side of our Lord was twice as wide as others, and it was shaped like a lance. The pain I felt was great, but it lasted barely one second. Beautiful. That's exactly right. You know that uh, Marie-Julie Jeanne used to spend hours on end before the Blessed Sacrament. What you... What your auditors will hear tonight in this particular uh, show is not just a recitation of a life. What you will hear is truly, in some respects, um, even a secret, I would dare say. Uh, you will hear things that have been purposely withheld because of the fear of sensationalism. The church does not want to put too much light on any... Uh, blessed or privileged soul that, of course, shows example of faith, but echoes a message, of course, of conversion, but also a conversion and a call to prayer for those who are faltering, mm -hmm. for those who are failing in the mission that have been granted to them. And this, I invite your auditors to listen very carefully because it's not just a recitation of events that took place ever so long ago. Some of the messages you will hear are very important and are very relevant to today's time. We are all adults. Uh, we are old, most of us at least fathers and husbands. It's imperative that you take these particular events, those examples, those messages to heart. I, for one, believe that there is no such thing as a coincidence. Again, everyone is here to listen carefully to these particular events, those examples, those messages, are meant to be heard, are meant to be read. And as you will hear in a few moments, even our Lord states so. So um, I consider it myself a gift for myself, for my family, and I hope for you. <laughs> so yes, in regards to all these notes I took and that I shared uh, with uh, close friends and family, the Blessed Virgin Mary, our Lord, has chosen Marie-Julie Janie for a very special mission, that of converting, redeeming sinners, principally the Roman Catholic Church in France. 
the eldest daughter of the church, or should I say the prodigal eldest daughter of the church. As you will see in this show and in the next ones to come, the Virgin Mary, very much like La Salette, points out that the need to prayer, conversion, a prayer for the church, prayer for France, for politician, is of the utmost importance. And surely, as we spoke you and I before, Monique, in private, no? It is true that in this particular case, uh, Marie-Julie Janis' messages orbit a great deal and principally around France, although she mentions England, Italy, uh, Germany, Northern Africa, and other countries. But principally France, why? Of course, we mentioned earlier, she's a patriot, but also because she stated that our Lord told her that in the times to come, France, in the times we are living now, France, in the West, in the Occidental um, culture, will falter and will collapse on its knees first. Immediately thereafter, followed by the rest of Western society and Western countries. Quote, unquote. But France will be, according to the revelation she received, the first nation as well to get back on its feet, and followed thereafter by the rest of the world. Yeah. So this is very important very relevant to the context of the time. Uh, from the end of the 19th century, from the end of the 1800s, all the way to our time, the society in France has gone lower and lower and lower. Mediocrity after mediocrity. Um, belittling. Betrayal. You know, the church becoming more and more politic, in too many instances, decides to remain silent. And there is no greater sign of collaboration or complicity in evil sometimes than to be quiet. And that's one of the messages that the Virgin Mary, our Lord, and even St. Michael the Archangel, has to leave it to Marie-Julie Jani. And so with all these things happening surrounding these apparitions, the bishop started two investigations. He started a, he, he investigated the gradual stigmata and then, and the alleged ec ecstasies, and then he ordered a medical inquiry as well, right? Right. right. And he chose he, someone very important to lead that inquiry. Yes, a very famous uh, medical professor. His, heart, his name is even hard for me to pronounce. He's from the region of Brittany, so very Celtic. So sometimes they have more vowels than consonants, so bear with me. The name of the doctor was uh, Dr. Angbert. And I'm sure I butchered the name, uh, but I'm sure the Professor or Dr. Angerbert will forgive me from high above. He indeed uh, was appointed directly by Monsignor Fournier. Monsignor Fournier, as I mentioned earlier, was very suspicious at the beginning because it all began with all of a sudden uh, moments of sheer ecstasy when Marie Julie Janis saw and spoke openly with our Lord, with the Virgin Mary, and so on and so forth. Extraordinary events. She began to uh, pray, uh, or or even be able to recognize objects whether or not they were blessed or not. She would kiss always those objects that were blessed without even looking at them. And those that were not blessed, every time, every single solitary time that were presented to her, she would simply ignore them. Only after, when it was done behind her back, after priests just blessed them in silence, and immediately without even looking at them, she smiled and kissed them. She was able to understand foreign languages including instructions that were given to her by priests in Latin. Now, we're talking of a young woman who didn't know or barely knew her A's or her B's. Her education was extremely limited. We're talking in the center of the countryside of Brittany in the late 1800s. Now, to that effect, uh, indeed, Monsignor Fournier began to hear extraordinary stories, people converting, people being remarkably healed. So he decided to send uh, uh, Dr. Fournier, that is uh, Dr. Ingebert, that was a highly diplomed uh, doctor from the University of Nantes. And the man uh, was at first, the doctor arrived very uh, down to earth, very Cartesian, trying to prove always everything by the negative. But immediately the man was seduced by something he could not explain. Such as, for example, in 1873, the stigmatas, uh, points of blood that began to come out of nowhere. 
and he was constantly, and I mean constantly, observing them. Uh, in 1873, at the same time, when the first report from this very Cartesian, very down-to-earth scientist was sent to Monseigneur Fournier, Monseigneur Fournier knew that every Friday, Marie-Julie Jeanne was leaving, literally leaving, the Passion of Our Lord, you know, through a Via Crucis in her garden. And of course, she was going through ex horrible suffering. She was relieving, literally, the Passion of Our Lord. So he went. Imagine his surprise when being somewhat suspicious, you know, he began to see this woman who probably never learned in her life to lie, begin to, out of sheer love, without any pretense, without any wish to even attract attention, began to suffer the Via Crucis, carrying of an invisible cross, collapsing three times, looking with pity, love in her eyes, at a person on her right who one could only guess was the Blessed Virgin Mary, and crying and getting up again, and all of a sudden feeling the help of a person no one else could see. Imagine the reaction of Monseigneur Fournier, who was immensely touched by the profound love, the lack of artificiality, the lack of plastic, if everything was genuine. This woman could not possibly act what she was living. At that moment, Monseigneur Fournier was immensely touched, and according to him and to some him, uh, many report, many, um, how would you say, other people uh, te giving testimony. Monsignor Fournier believed from that moment forth, because no one is that good of an actor. No one can show so much affection and love towards God as this woman did. This woman that was not a young spring chicken, as the Americans say. No. And she but was, nevertheless, she, he could see her part. bleeding. He could see yeah. her bleeding at, at the same time. Oh, of course he was. He was. And so he gave strict orders to Dr. Einberg, not only to continue making uh, weekly reports on her spiritual, but particularly her physical uh, state, so that the formal dossier would start to be opened. And so he did, and faithfully, to the point that even my professor and Dr. Einberg concentrated and dedicated his life to God by helping, reporting, and classifying every single event that took place in the life of Marie-Julie Jeanne while he was able to witness. And we are only scratching the surface of, uh, of the iceberg. The sheer amount of extraordinary events, Monique, could not be counted. You mentioned earlier, very correctly, very rightfully so, that there are over 120,000 pages of events, messages, and miracles recorded. Can you imagine? It's an entire library of a page. And I think, and I thought my book was long, 569 pages. <laughs> Rubbish. <laughs> 220,000 pages. But the message is remarkable. This particular case truly began, you could uh, objectively said, in 1873 and finished in March of 1941 in the middle of World War II and the German occupation in France. But what's remarkable, what's more, uh, Monique, is that the prophecies, everything she, she announced in advance, including the death and the place of the death of Melanie Calvat, the visionary of La Salette, uh, the events that took place, uh, the largest explosion of the largest volcano in the Caribbean, everything, World War I, World War II, every single thing she predicted, was predicted without any historical errors, none whatsoever, period, including the war of Algeria, where France finally left after winning the war, but left nonetheless, as per the request of General de Gaulle. What's more frightening, and that we will talk about that later, but this is what it's so important to appreciate this tremendous gift of, that is sent to us by heaven, not to add to our faith. Nothing can add to our faith. The dogma of the faith is perfect and complete. But this message is, is a message of warning. I would say further, a message of love. It is a mother and a father telling the children imploringly, please change. You do not know what awaits you if you continue in the path you are in. 
That is again what uh, Marie-Julie Jeanne is echoing again and again. And so, so yes, the bishop gave her complete credibility and supported her, gave even permission for the spreading of the messages and revelations she was receiving. And uh, it went on very, very well until unfortunately, at the end of uh, Monsignor Fournier's life, he passed away and was replaced by another uh, bishop who I regret to say was not quite as friendly as Monsignor Fournier. The name of this Bousseau was uh, Bishop Lecoq from, of course, the same city, no. Yes. So if we go back to the visit that Bishop, uh, the Bishop of North uh, made to, to, Julie Ma to Marie Julie Jaime, he brought her a special gift. He brought her the cross of Paré Le Monial. Yes. Right? And yes. what happened? She, something really, ha really neat happened then. Exactly. Uh, again, Marie Julie Jaime was uh, fixing with her eyes uh, at an imaginary point where she was seeing something, should I say someone? The good bishop bought her this particular cross that came from Paris le Monial, which is uh, another place of uh, the famous saint, um, visionary and saint uh, and Margaret uh, uh, Lecoq. And, uh, exactly. exactly. And remarkably enough, uh, without even looking or hearing anyone, no one said a word it was she was being completely quiet and all of a sudden just looking at um not even looking still looking straight at god or the virgin mary just touching the cross she said um marguerite the name of the visionary which i always forget but for marguerite a good friend marie. <laughs> marguerite marie Lac oh. Alacoc. so and the bishop was surprised this came exactly from this particular place, Paris Le Monial. And remarkably enough, this one without even looking at it, just by touching it from the side, immediately guessed. This was more than enough for the bishop to understand that this could not uh, come from a human being alone. This was, as he wrote in his letter in June of 1876, truly miraculous, truly supernatural. And that, by the way, is one of the arguments in every apparition site is used as an argument in favor in the approval process of any apparition site, whether or not it is indeed supernatural and coming uh, in from high above in coordination and acceptance uh, without any contradiction with the dogma of the faith. Mm -hmm. So yes, that's a very good anecdote you brought forth. Did the children, I think the children of Garabandal had a similar uh, phenomena, right? They could, they could tell what was blessed and what wasn't? Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, there are many particular events, many uh, similar cases um, of supernatural events between the visionaries of Garabandal and marie julie Jeanne. For example, what you are referring to is was also a piece of wood that came from the Holy Cross. No, was presented to the children of Garabandal. They were able to guess as well. This happened uh, many times. There were other extraordinary cases, for instance, and I put some notes here, but I'm not going to follow the same uh, rhythm of my own notes, but being said, uh, one of the remarkable common events with Garavandal was from one moment to the other, uh, Marie-Julie Jeanne, uh, while in ecstasy, became heavier uh, than a boulder of stone. Three men, three strong men, or should I say even three strong Frenchmen, <laughs> were not able to lift her. No. But, um, and that was extraordinary. A little woman of this age, particularly when she was in her 70s, 80s, and later uh, 90s, to be able to be that heavy, it was, she was not blocking herself. It was incomprehensible. At the same time, the sheer opposite also took place a couple of times when she could be as light as a feather and she could be lifted with only one hand. The same thing happened to the children of Garavandal. Quite remarkable. No? It is something to be noted, especially for the people and the authorities, the religious authorities of our time. There was another case where, for example, not just one case, there were a few cases when there were cases of levitation, particularly when Marie-Julie Jeanne was praying on, on her bed. Uh, she, according to the reports that I read in French, 
the highest amount of distance she was able to levitate above her bed was almost 12 inches, which, and this English system of yours drives me cuckoo. I think that 12 inches is a foot, if I'm not mistaken, no? Which is about uh, something like this, about 40, 45 centimeters or so, no? But that, uh, the same thing again happened also to the children of Garabandal, and always while preserving her uh, humility, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Skirt always properly folded, not revealing anything, uh, the same as the children of Garabandal. A great many uh, common factors in both apparition cases, including the messages themselves, as we shall see at a later stage when we'll go to the, when we will cover the chapter of Garabandal. But as I said before, of all the chapters I wrote in this book, this one uh, um, occupies a special place in my heart. First of all, because of the lady herself. Uh, she was by herself, alone, willing to suffer truly hell on earth for the conversion of sinners, not just for France, but for sinners all over the world. This message, as I mentioned earlier, although it arounds, orbits, underlines France principally, it is also a message for the rest of the world. Now, before being a Frenchman, a proud Frenchman, no, um, I am first and foremost a Catholic. So for all your auditors that are Anglo-Saxon or Hispanic or wherever you may be from, you and I are compatriots if you're Catholic. I am first Roman Catholic and son of God and of the Blessed Virgin Mary, as are you. So this message is indeed for all of you. This example is for all of us. So to get back to Marguerite Marie à la coque, there is a special link between uh, Marie-Julie and Marguerite Marie. Jesus compared the two in a bit, in a way. She, what did Jesus say? Excellent. Our Lord told Marie-Julie Jani at the sight of Marie and Annie, Marie de la Coque, that uh, she uh, was to uh, echo the glory of his sacred heart. However, the mission of Marie Julie was other, was another. Hers was to echo and promulgate the glory of his cross, the suffering, the conversion. But our Lord said at the same time to Marie Julie that of her two daughters, Marie Julie would be the one who would receive the greatest amount of gifts. And indeed, he kept his promise. Uh, one of these particular promises and uh, was indeed that Marie-Julie Jeannie uh, would unite to our Lord as one of his brides. Now, it is a term that is used for all religious um, nuns, all religious women. Um, Marie-Julie Jeannie was a Franciscan third order, as you know. But our Lord promised her something yet considerably more, more uh, intimate, closer with sheer beauty, uh, cleanliness, purity. And to express this sheer true love, unconditional love between two souls, our Lord, out of uh, his sheer um, tenderness, uh, forged out of uh, Marie-Julie Jeannie's own flesh on her finger, um, a ring, which uh, appeared of a coral, coral red color and it was incomprehensible not a classification it was too strong too big to have been formed for classification which usually may take months if not years this came from one moment to the other and this was the ring among other things that our lord gave his new bride a bride of the heart a bride of the soul um a bride that totally gave herself uh, body and soul to heaven no when i say body through her suffering, through uniting herself to the passion of Christ. For the same reasons, the salvation of those Christ loved most, his children on earth. No. And to that effect, Marie-Julie Jeannie united herself completely to that, accepting, embracing the uh, utter sufferings that she experienced uh, while being alive. No. As you saw, uh, the least of her sufferings were extensive, to say the least. She not only uh, suffered uh, the passion of the Christ, the stigmata, the stigmatas, but she likewise, on some instances, always forewarned in advance, uh, had her members completely blocked 
died or not, she suffered what cannot be expressible in human words, such as suffering. You know? Always relieved during a particular time of the day for her family members to be able to, shall we say, to be able to change uh, the, um, the sheets of a bed or to be able to uh, change her as well or to be able to um, take care of her properly. And then immediately when that was done, uh, immediately again, she felt in this uh, paralysis that completely kept her uh, handicapped to the point that even in advance and gradually, always gradually to help her prepare, she offered her sight. She offered her voice. She became blind, mute, even deaf. She became completely imprisoned in a body of sheer pain, but which she accepted. I know it's very hard to accept and to listen to the, all this. It's very difficult. It certainly was for me, as I said, as many other things that I wrote in this book. It is a concept that's ghastly and very hard to accept. Nevertheless, it's a vocation. I ask you this. I know, Monique, you're a mother. I'm a father. Which amongst your viewers who are parents would not be willing to be crucified for their children? I would, without even a second thought. No. Marie-Julie Jani did exactly that in a way that we cannot understand. Why was it necessary to suffer so? You only have to see the events that take place in society of the time, all the way going worse and worse and worse, all the way to the 21st century. Humanity has become a sure example of bestiality. And Marie-Julie Jani did not sacrifice herself just for her contemporary countrymen or fellow men, but for all men between, that will live between her time to the coming of Christ. Okay. It's extraordinary. It's a very difficult to uh, dominate one's emotion when one fathoms and puts in the balance the extraordinary sacrifice that this woman has done for humanity. Uh, there was another example as well that showed, um, for example, devotion to Christ, and that also was very difficult for me to accept. On one instance, the, um, the French stigmatist was looking at a particular painting of our Lord Jesus Christ uh, at the feet, uh, at the feet where appeared his mother, uh, Marie Magdalene, and St. John. It's a very famous painting, uh, which I reproduce and put in my, my living room. All of a sudden, she was there with another priest, I think Father David, who was her spiritual advisor, assigned by Bishop Fournier, and with Dr. Humbert. Uh, no, I beg your pardon. Dr. Humbert was absent. It was just Father David, who also was the pastor of the village of Blanc. And all of a sudden, she, her sister was there as well, a remarkable woman, fully attentive and a practicing, devoted woman as well. All of a sudden, Marie-Julie Jeannie, looking at this crucifix, began to say, oh, my God, le sang, the blood, from the feet, from the hand, from the side of this painting, began bleeding drops of blood, human blood. Immediately, Marie-Julie Jeannie said, uh, attrapez les Recover them, catch them. Immediately the sister came, took a flask and a bit of cotton and put it therein. And all of a sudden, as all the attention was on the, on the, on the painting, then they looked after the gathered blood and they looked at Marie-Julie Jeannie. And what did they see? Marie-Julie Jeannie with a crucifix going like this, appearing to be drinking or sucking on something. And her lips were red. A crucifix began as well to bleed and she began to consume this human blood. I know, I know the reaction of some of your auditors. I know even perhaps yours. I know what was mine. I was shocked. I did not understand. I admit, I confess to you, this was a concept of faith which was so extreme. I did not understand. I did not accept. It took me a very long time to do so. But again, I always try, for me it all served me well, and it's very therapeutic, to try to analyze things with a cold hand, stepping backwards when I, I find myself in such a situation. And then I realize one particular, uh, or rather remembered, 
one statement that our Lord said when he was alive to the apostle, and I wrote it here. He said, for my flesh is true food, and my blood is a true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. So, we are Catholics, or at least we call ourselves so. Every Sunday, when we go to Mass, when we receive the Holy Eucharist, in both specimens, are we not drinking the body, or are we not drinking the blood of our Lord? Are we not eating his body through the Holy Eucharist? So, this taking a step backwards, <laughs> calming my fires, I realized this was nothing more but a message. A message that heaven knew would be repeated, would be read. And this is what we are doing tonight. This is what your each auditor right now that are listening to this are receiving. It's a message from heaven which states this. Do not doubt. Every time you go to the Mass, every time you receive the Holy Eucharist or the wine in both specimens, I give you my heart, you drink my blood, and he who does so abides in me, and I in him. What a great message. Sensationalist? <laughs> of course. Oh, of course. That statement was considerably more sensationalist. The life of Christ was more sensationalist. Surely, I can hear also some people saying, I have faith. I do not need to hear this or to know this. Probably so. But there are some people whom God deemed needed to hear this particular message, needed to hear or read this particular incident. Guadalajara, I am amazed myself of the Eucharistic miracle that is taking place as we speak in Guadalajara, right now in Mexico. A Holy Eucharist beating with the speed and rhythm of a human heart. What's the message? Lanciano, the apparition, the apparition, the Eucharistic miracle of Lanciano. It is almost, uh, I think it's 11 centuries old. It's the perfect, uh, complete structure of a human heart, cut with the precision of a laser, with human blood, type B in the veins and arteries. The specimen of the blood, or rather that used to be the wine, transformed into blood. Coagulations of blood clots, immense, that when put with water, guess what? The impossible. It becomes living cells of a human blood. That is scientifically unexplainable. And not just that, but it's the blood of a man who is going through torture. It, the, the cells are living cells. It's remarkable. Yes. So for so, whoever well, doesn't believe, this is really, there's so much, a wealth of proof that God really is in the Holy Eucharist. Yes. So uh, I was one of those, I tell you very honestly, that to appear wise, especially in conversations of living rooms, no? The conversation de salon, as we say in French. I used to mm, think of my appearance. I should not come to conclusion. Oh, yes, perhaps, etc. What a fool <laughs> I was, no? I, I give myself the excuse of youth. Now, the fact of the matter is, to come back to seriousness, this again and again, whether in Anciano, whether in Guadalajara, whether in Marie, in the time of Marie-Julie Jeanne, and this message, this miracle, you could call it contemporary, because today you are listening to it. Today, in 2022, do you think for one moment that God would not have possibly have guessed that this would be talked about, discussed, and used as an instrument for the conversion of many, even almost a century later? Of course he did. The same way, when he instituted the church on the ground, on the stone which Peter was, he knew very well what the Catholic, would, Catholic church would become. But remember, it's true. The fires of hell will never overcome them. So to come back to this particular situation, you can write, uh, Monique, these events were only but a few that took place in the late 19th centuries to transfer, to communicate, to give to those who are fit, to those who are consumed with love, a message of hope. You are not alone. I am with you till the end of times. Every time you go to, to, come to confession, to mass, there will you find me. That's the sole message that is being brought from Marie Julie and this being only one of many more examples. And as you said, she was always warned of these events that would happen ahead of time, 
so that when they did happen, it was a confirmation. It was a fulfilling of these prophecies. And one of these prophecies was that our Lord said that he would illuminate her or he would surround her with light. And yeah. it happened. Yes. Quite so. Yes, I know exactly what you're referring yourself to. Brilliant. Indeed. Uh, there was a time when uh, on the, I believe it was on the palm of the hand, uh, all of a sudden, and she was surrounded by a good half a dozen people, including her sister, who was very beloved, and a lady whom she considered a maternal and adoptive mother. And they all witnessed for a period of time, I believe that that is written in the book, that lasted for about 15 minutes, if memory serves. It was a little source of bright white light whose source could not be determined. Just imagine, white light coming from a source that no one can figure out where it came from. But it appeared to come from the center of the palm of her hand. And it was foretold. It was foretold in advance. And those half people, including Dr. Iberme, uh, was present to report it to the bishop, uh, Fournier. That's a brilliant uh, statement you made, as usual, <laughs> Monique. But yes, this is an example, again, a print of God's finger upon this chosen soul. And I believe that the reason why he's given so many extraordinary signs on these poor victim souls who self-sacrifice herself is to give, among other things, credibility, belligerence to the message that heaven was echoing through this remarkable woman, who, as I, I said before, didn't barely know her A's or her B's, and yet was able to discuss with the most learned of theologians uh, the life of Christ, no? who was able to respond in Latin and obey to Latin or foreign languages commands. Remarkable. This is meant for one reason. Again, using Cartesian reasoning, what other interpretation could there be? Love of God, love of the church, call for the faith of the church, and all these events which science is incapable, simply, utterly, incompetently, incapable to explain by scientific terms. This in itself can only demonstrate that what is impossible for man is only possible to God. Now, this was meant for the factor of credibility of the messages which are to come and which will be revealed to you shortly. It follows what our Lord said in the Bible, that he would baffle the, the, the brilliant. I mean, he, that the <laughs> children would have a better understanding than the brilliant people. Yeah. So, yes. Now, our Lady spoke in Medjugorje about fasting and the importance of fasting. Julie Marie Jaini Marie uh, gave a whole new meaning to fasting. She went full, you know. Tell us about that. Yes. Nothing short than five years. No. I'll explain. Um, for one time, as uh, the request for suffering was going in crescendo, in other words, increasingly so, uh, one day, Marie-Julie Jani announced to Dr. Rambert that uh, she was too fast on the Eucharist, on both specimens alone, for five years, I believe, 20... Seven months and 22 days, something of the sort. You get a picture for about over five years. Imagine the reaction, and it was well recorded, the reaction of alarm that the good French doctor felt when he heard this, what consider, was considered for him um, sheer uh, suicide. And she now, was so then, frail. She was very frail. She was already an old woman. And she said that she was not to consume any other element outside the Holy Eucharist in the specimen of the Eucharist or of the bread and or of the wine for five years, for over five years. Imagine the reaction of the doctor. He tried by all means to convince her. This is really pas raisonnable. No, 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 vous ne comprenez pas. It's not reasonable. No, 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 you do not understand the consequences of what you're saying. Doctor, this is my mission. Keep your faith in God. She answered. And so the Poor doctor was on the brink of tears and reported this matter to the uh, Diocese of Nantes. And so she kept her word. For five years and more, she only lived on the Eucharist. 
both specimens. And remarkably enough, this is a medical observation which holds no importance at all. The miracle in itself is enough. But for those of you who want the full story, she never excreted either in any form during that period of time. Again, I submit to any doubters or any cynic out there that this is impossible. This has never ever taken place in recorded um, medical history. This is an example that science is again pathetically incapable to explain. Period. Now, again, the print of God on his chosen one, on his uh, bride, on his daughter. But not just for her, for us, for you, for me. And yes, indeed, this is, these are but a few of the remarkable ex um, <laughs> examples you bring forth to the people's attention. Well done, Monique. <laughs> and she also had a great friendship with the saints, with angels, and a special relationship with St. Joseph. Did she know? <laughs> yes, I know exactly again what you're referring yourself to. Brilliant. <laughs> On one instance, St. <laughs> Joseph, who appeared to her, as well as a great many other saints. But in this particular instance, St. Joseph and she, uh, because he was such a soft soul, no? Marie-Jolie Jeanine was teasing him, playing innocently with him and saying, why won't you tell me, Saint Joseph, about this particular secret? And Saint Joseph did not respond negatively, but he didn't know how not to respond or how not to hurt her feelings. He was extremely careful. And all of a sudden she was insisting, perhaps a bit too much, too insistently. And all of a sudden, <laughs> to her great surprise, our Lord, uh, Jesus Christ, appeared to come to the rescue of his uh, stepfather or adopted father, no, and said to Marie Julie Janine in a stern voice, Ça suffit, enough. <laughs> Marie, -Julie, Marie Julie Janine looked at Jesus and went, like, like, my brother has great facial expressions, I'm trying to imitate him. He used to go, mm, oh, oh. <laughs> immediately she, <laughs> she went down and she was terribly embarrassed. And I suspect that our Lord had a bit of a smile because. She, this woman was incapable of any evil or uh, mal um, <laughs> behavior. If anything else, she was innocent, possibly like a little girl, but she went possibly overboard. She crossed a line perhaps, and the Saint Joseph didn't know or wouldn't defend himself properly, but it was time to put order and our Lord came and in a very loving way. But it was enough for Marie-Julie Juni to learn her lesson. <laughs> but it's a very funny story. It was talked many times afterwards, with a smile on the corners of those people who were present, who heard the story, even on Marie-Julie Jeanne herself. She had a sense of humor. <laughs> now, now we're going to switch to something a little more serious. Um, ah. She, as like Padre Pio, like the curate of ours, like many others, she endured terrible attacks from the devil. Oh, yes. Yes. That's quite true. And that's another message. Um, hmm. How to approach this? Whenever a soul is invited to get closer to God, that particular soul as well will expose itself to assault of the enemy. That's a price. No. And Marie-Julie Janie was no exception to this particular rule. And the greater and closer she was to God, the more intense the attacks were perpetrated against her. Very much as you said, Monique, very much like Padre Pio. She used to call uh, the blooming uh, fool, as many Frenchmen called him, or many religious men call him, Keke. <laughs> uh, very appropriate name. Um, not to use two, another two vowels in the word, no? So she used to call him Keke. And uh, the, that particular... <laughs> The enemy, shall we say. I don't want to honor him by even saying his name. He does not deserve any form of honor, but despise and pity, not even pity, sheer despise. That soul, the enemy of God, used to assault her in every way she could, even if physically. Uh, she was breaking in her room branches of crucifixes, breaking afterwards even rosaries, slashing her flesh, which immediately, by the way, 
when holy water was placed on those particular slashes on her body, the body immediately healed instantaneously. Um, so those particular events took place and Marie-Julie Jeanne accepted, again, for the conversion of sinners. There is nothing when you think about it, and I know that some of you might be frightening listening to these horrors, horror story, but think about this carefully and reasonably. If you take a step backwards and you think about it all, you are not made of just this matter. You are a soul that occupies this, this instrument that we call a body. There's nothing, nothing at all that this pathetic soul that claims itself, himself the enemy of God can do against your soul if you're close to God. In the words of St. Michael the Archangel, if you are with God, who can be against you? This is very superficial. It, hurt, it hurts, yes. It's frightening. But the enemy of God uh, nourishes himself on the fear that he wants to inspire. If you poke fun at this pathetic creature and at his little minions, pathetic in any way, it's really pathetic. That's all they can do? Is that it? Pathetic. Place yourself in the hands of God. Hide yourself in the sacred heart of Christ. And of the Blessed Virgin May, you would be totally invincible. And that is what Marie-Julie Janie was echoing. She didn't care. She thought sometimes the devil appeared to her as a big dog. And she said, get out of here. She despised him. And this creature left. There was nothing it could do. It tried to break her. Failed pathetically. <laughs> pathetically. It reminds me of... Uh... Of Saint Gemma, Saint Gemma, Gemma Galgani, and Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich, they also saw the devil as a big dog who was hoovering and everything. And they just said, "Ah, it's just it. It's just it. It's just he's yeah. nothing." So nothing. Piece of dust. Even uh, Father Michel Rodrigue used to say the same thing. He's nothing. Just to provoke him, he's a piece of dust. He's nothing. And then it made it enraged the the pathetic one. But uh, he's so clever. <laughs> Go ahead. No, I was saying, Father Michel says it's he's just a little bibit, a little bug. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, but the devil, although however pathetic uh, this uh, sick soul is, uh, can be can use a great deal of intelligence, and he's very astute and skillful. You have to be as well on your guard. He appeared to Marie-Julie Jeanne in many instances um, as a very handsome man, sometimes even as a very handsome angel, promising mm -hmm. her all sorts of things. But uh, Marie-Julie Jeanne used to use a great deal of holy water and sprinkling the pathetic one, which immediately ran the tail between his legs. Pathetic. Now, also sometimes uh, the devil, according to the records, appear to her as some sort of angels, but with always with some sort of imperfection in its appearance. Either the aureole was a little bit crooked or the cross was almost horizontal or the, one of the branches of the cross was imperfect. She was able to detect immediately uh, whether it was from heaven or from the, from the enemy. Also, she was trying always to test those apparitions, whether it came from heaven or, or God, by seeing the reaction upon the name of Mary and of Jesus Christ. No, she knew she was protected, as we are all, if we declare ourselves sons and daughters of Christ and of the Virgin Mary. To that effect, uh, many times after I read the book, um, particularly the book of the Marquis de la Franquerie, who was one of the principal uh, biographers of uh, Marie-Julie Jeanne, he recorded a credit of messages. Uh, there were many times that I was not envious in a Malicious, malicious way, but um, I wanted, I would have loved rather to have those kind of experience, to be able to see the Blessed Virgin Mary, to ask to kiss her hand or her foot or to tell her je t'aime. I do not need to see her. We do not need to see her to do these things. But now, uh, and it took me, I discovered, I realized that late in life, I'm 53 years old, you know, it was finally <laughs> in this... Uh, when one realizes that one is closer to the end rather than to the beginning, one starts to think in a different manner than when one is a young man or woman. I realized 
that not being able to see her when perhaps under different circumstances it would have been permitted is also a gift because the price to pay such as that that paid Padre Pio, the price that oh, the unmentionable price that Marie Julie Genet accepted to pay with a smile on her lips, with her heart consumed with love, is overwhelming. And I believe I would have been very likely incapable to bear. So today, at my age, I say merci to do what I do and not to be exposed uh, to uh, a price that would be possibly too much for me to bear. Voilà. Because when we see the other side of the veil, we don't only see the beauty, our lady, the angels, we also see evil. We see the demons, we see, we can see both. Yes, yeah. exactly. It's a fight, it's a war. A war in which I believe, Monique, we are all called to participate. This is a modern time crusade. Each and every one who hears your show, that of uh, John Henry Weston or, um, or um, Christine Bacon or others, are called to bear, to, care, to bear the cross, like our ancestors when they went to Jerusalem. This time it is not to deliver Jerusalem from Salhaudin, but this time it is to deliver um, our church, our souls, to free ourselves from the slavery of sin. But we are called to bear the cross and to take out of our scabbard the sword. This is one sort of sword that we are called to wear, to bear and to use for the salvation of our lives, of our souls, of the church and of our countries, respective countries. You know? Marie-Julie Janine again and again repeats this in her messages. The revelation she's given, and this will be next week, I echo exactly that particular context of ideas. It's truly, in my opinion, one of the most extraordinary messages that cohabitates and complements the apparitions of Fatima, which, by the way, this began before, during, and after Fatima, mm -hmm. which complement as well the messages of Garabandal, that sometimes thereafter, and Akita, in Japan, the message of Akita, as we discussed at the very, very one of our very first meetings, is the third secret of Fatima. Those are not my words, but Cardinal Ratzinger in 1980. So these messages of Marie Julie Jani echo exactly that. Mm -hmm. And um, to get back to the testing of spirits, I've always I've, I'm always interesting interested to see how visionaries test the spirits. And another thing that she did. And I'm saying this for our audience members because I know that there are some who have written to us and have asked us, you know, how do we know if it's truly Our Lady or truly a saint or, or if it's the devil? Well, Marie-Julie would also ask them to make an act of love to the Sacred Heart. And if they complied, then she knew they were good. But if they didn't, they fled. If, if they, yeah, they fled and she knew. So... It's, it's nice to see all these different little techniques that each of these visionaries had to know, but you never know. We might see them one day, right? So it's good to know. So also, okay, so you mentioned that the bishop who was supportive of her passed away, and this new bishop came along, and he imposed very strict restrictions on her. Yes. Um, the name of the bishop was, uh, in, in English, it translates as the rooster, lecoq, yes. now the rooster. Uh, for some um, unexplainable reasons, you could call it, you could say, um, profound dislike of sensationalism. No. The bishop thought it was too theatrical, that uh, Marie-Julie Jani was making too many theatrics. The message was too extravagant, too severe against clergy, against the Catholic Church, not just of the time, but of the future, as you will soon discover. So... For that moment, she, uh, the, the new bishop uh, ordered her to cease immediately her activities, uh, which Marie-Julie Jani uh, obeyed, but continued to, to pray and do the Via Crucis. But for some reason, uh, she was still attracting attention, and people were still talking about her, to the point that the bishop Lecoq had decided to exempt her and uh, take away from her 
the practice of receiving Holy Communion. For us Catholics, since we all know that the Eucharist is not a symbol, it is truly the body and blood, soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is life for us, for Marie-Julie Jenny as well, more so perhaps than it was for us. So in a very uncharitable, unparochial, which is one of their favorite expressions that are heard and pronounced over and over again, ever so scandalously today by so many priests, not all of them. Now, such contradiction. So unparochial, it was prohibited from her to receive Holy Eucharist from, from any parish priest, period. Our Lord um, appeared to her and out of his mercy, angrily gave her communion, angry at Lecoq. On one instance, there is one part, and I wrote about it in the book, it's a somewhat extraordinary anecdote. And uh, I didn't write it on my notes, uh, but the anecdote was this. Our Lord one day, uh, yeah. while giving communion on a Sunday to Marie-Julie Jeanne, uh, told her, my daughter, why is it not that you, you are not screaming on all four winds to claim the injustice that this man, this bishop who is not serving me, uh, uh, is doing to you? Uh, this man will have to appear after his death before me and will have to give you communion long after, will pass before me under judgment. And you know what Marie-Julie's response was? Uh, he is the authority. He is the church I must obey. And when you will condemn him, I will hide in a little corner of the, of the, of the uh, judgment room of the courtroom and I will pray for him. Now, this is, uh, if you discuss to a theologian the interpretation of this particular anecdote, he will most likely say to you that it is not meant that Marie-Julie Jeanne was more merciful than Christ. Of course not. Any goodness that any human being has comes from God. We are miserable creatures, no? But God knew, again, this anecdote would be told. This anecdote would be read. And there is a message in this, that however justified you are in your anger against the Roman Catholic Church due to its many countless injustices, we must remain faithful, obedient, and merciful. That is the message that our Lord gave through the uh, display of this particular anecdote. And this was perfectly, in an exemplary fashion, displayed by Marie-Julie Chani. This is a message. Our Lord is also, remember, true God. Jesus Christ was true God, but true man. He felt the feeling of anger, even when he was here on earth. We all know the story of the market, of the merchants in the market. You know? So sometimes we are justified um, revolted, revolted against the injustices, the errors that our church commits. We must nevertheless kill our fires uh, within our souls of mercy, like Marie-Julie Janine in this particular instance, pray for them, because they are, remember, they are the first target of the enemy, of the pathetic one, because they are consecrated souls to Christ, to the Virgin Mary. One brief parenthesis, again, I know we mentioned it before, but Garabandal, um, the Virgin told Mar uh, Conchita Gonzalez that she, if she sees a priest next to an angel, she is to kneel before the priest first. Because they hold the body of Christ. They have consecrated hands. So no matter how, who was it who said, oh, it's St. Catherine of Siena. No matter where he had devil, he would still have to, you know, respect the office. He had to because he holds the body of Christ. So yes. It says a lot. Now, can you tell us a bit more about her ecstasies? When she was she was tested, she was put through testing while she was in ecstasy. Just like, well, the children of Fatima were and the children of Gehalmodal were. She also went through that. Yes. And like the children of Medjugorje. And I'm dying to, in a couple of weeks, to discuss that particular case because there were a great deal of scientists, scientific tests. Something happened to Marie Julie Jenny. She was quite right. While she fell in ecstasy, her state was that of um, sheer staring at the beauty, not just that was presented to her by our Lord or the Virgin Mary, 
sometimes she saw even the Holy Spirit present itself to a whiter than white uh, flame. And that particular flame allowed her, and St. Michael the Archangel too, allowed her to understand teachings of our faith, the future events that were to come. So she was mesmerized, hypnotized of souls, no? So the scientists, and it was the obligation of Father Ambert, no, Father Ambert, Dr. Ambert, to try every known technique to see how she would react and the stress. So while in ecstasy, the good doctor, and believe me, he, he was against contre bonne nature bon coeur, as we say in French, against his own nature, he began to pinch like uh, little boys, bad little boys, like my son does, to his sister, like this, just to, to see if it would hurt her. No response. They would try to uh, approach a flame next to her, no response. A light brighter than bright on her eyes, the pupils didn't change. A needle, boom, in the, in the middle of her flesh, inserted deeply inside her flesh, no response. Extraordinary, impossible. Maybe not impossible, but shall we say impossible under these circumstances and under such a person of that advanced age, not to respond, unless she uh, had some sort of condition, which according to Dr. Ambert, who was a specialist in general medicine, was not her case. On many instances, this man, who had received a formation most of his life, who, was l who learned to study as objectively as possible every medical situation that was presented to him, reported again and again, not just to Monseigneur Fournier, but even to Monseigneur Lecoq, trying to explain, to convince him that this uh, a case cannot be explained in scientific terms. No? Not just the prickling, not just the slight, but the levitation. Try. If anyone doubts this, I invite them to try. I'd like to see that. I really would pay for some euros to see that. And for about two or three minutes. Huh? I don't think so. You have to be objective, yes. But objective as well in what cannot be scientifically explained. And you have to come up with an answer. There is no such thing as there is no explanation. There is always is an explanation. It doesn't mean that if man is incapable of explaining the unexplainable, that there is no explanation. It means that there is a science, a spirit that is way above us. How do you explain fire to an ant? There is no explanation. Same goes for us in these instances. You have to yeah. remain objective and not condemn so quickly. Now, to those who would say, well, that's demonic, who's to say it's not demonic? What would you say to that? I would say, well, in that case, the devil has converted, goodness sake, for a devil to finally call to receive the Eucharist, to go to the Catholic Church, to confess, to receive baptism, and to deny himself, the devil? Blimey, what? <laughs> I know he's pathetic, but I do not believe he's that much of a, I don't think he's that thick. <laughs> I don't think so. Yeah. That okay. would be my answer. That is not reasonable, a statement. It's not objective, and that would echo simply the absent-minded or the unlearned, those who do not know what they're talking about. And also, um, relics, when in, when in ecstasy, she could tell things about relics. She could tell things about, I beg your pardon. She could recognize, she could recognize the, the, the origin of relics. She could yes. Recognize. She could tell she, stories about the relics that theologians didn't know about, that architects... Uh, yeah. Brilliant. Again, uh, you're absolutely right. She was able to, for example, when relics of some saints were presented to her, sometimes she concentrated, looked at them carefully, as if she was hearing something. And then she was revealing to a great deal of theologian, and this has been recorded, again, in those 120,000 plus pages, uh, events in history, in the life history of some saints, events that were totally unknown by historians. Surely, of course, uh, the contradictors will say, well, yes, but how do we know it was true? We don't. But it's, it's uh, quite unusual for a woman that has never learned the origins of um, or the life's uh, stories of some saints to be able to tell you where, for example, Santa Christine came from, what was the name of her mother or her age. And some events of his life or other saints, uh, how could she possibly know their origins or some of the stories that were already identified as being true? No? And adding yet some more information. 
it would take a remarkable mind, a well-trained mind, an exceptionally intelligent mind, to come up with some such studied events at a moment's notice, unprepared, especially when all of a sudden some objects were presented to her. There is nothing to gain. No. Uh, she has been able to provide all the proofs that already showed the supernatural as very capably what was explained by Monsignor Fournier. So this was not necessary. It was simply, you could say, a bonus, an information which intrigued a great many historians, including theologians. So you are quite right. This woman was gifted with the gift of knowledge, uh, the gift of uh, also prophecy. Mm -hmm. Yes, quite right. And she was surrounded, she had many angels. She didn't have just one guardian angel, right? Absolutely. I know you love that particular subject, uh, Monique. <laughs> Quite so. She had one particular guardian angels, but she had a cohort of others, accessory uh, angels that were protecting her, advising her, making sure she would be prepared. So um, preparing her for the sufferings, she was never alone. Um, and I know you wanted to talk about this, but uh, she was given not just those particular gifts from heaven, one particular one involving our Lord Jesus Christ as a baby. You remember? Oh, yes, that's a special anecdote. Please share. <laughs> well, uh, indeed, and uh, I discussed it with you. I, I thought the way you, dis you discussed it was much more charming. You, you described it with the heart of a mother. No, you're a mom, and it was charming. Yes, our Lord and the Virgin Mary, I think it was the, uh, the Blessed Virgin Mary, appeared one day with her child Jesus in her arms and told her in advance that she wanted that our Lord wanted to be in Marie Jolie's arms. Marie Jolie, very intimidated, like the woman from Brittany that she was, did not find herself worthy to receive in her hands the body of, of Jesus, no? So Our Lady, as you can imagine, ever so gracefully, in such a motherly, feminine manner, approached Marie Jolie and entrusted her heart a son, into the arms of the pious woman who started crying, receiving this, this, the king of kings in her arms, this little child, perfect child, you know, who I understand also kissed her, I believe, on her forehead, if memory serves, and caressed her, this I remember, her face. So, God, <laughs> if anything, so this uh, particular case, has shown that truly he's a poet and pure kindness, a kindness that I'm afraid ever so few human, human beings are able to display towards one another. It's very touching. In some instances, when I was <laughs> reviewing some of the pages uh, of Marie-Julie Janis' uh, experiences with heaven, uh, I was feeling like an intruder. The, some of the exchanges between heaven and our Lord or the Virgin Mary with uh, Marie Julie Jani were so deep, so personal. I felt, my goodness, I should not be reading this. This is, I felt truly like an intruder. It was not my place. But then afterwards, again, taking some recul, as we say in French, some step backwards, you realize that everything in this particular apparition case is nothing short of a gift for those who read, who are allowed somewhat, even indirectly, even with the print of time to participate. It's a remarkable gift. There are no words to express one's um, gratefulness for this extraordinary experience. I sincerely invite all of your auditors, spectators, to read this. It is meant for us all. We cannot but have a sense of awe and wonder and shock <laughs> when it comes to these these messages, they're beautiful. If right. you will, if, if you'll allow me, Xavier, I'd like to read that passage in your book. Please. Where she describes what she felt when she held our Lord. It's just so poetic, it's beautiful. So she said, and it was on Christmas night of 1879, she said, I felt in my soul a great heat of love which set me ablaze. I felt my soul leaving and going in the midst of a multitude of angels who were going to the divine crib. And when I was at the holy child's crib, 
I felt the same burning as I had never felt before. And at once the holy child said to his dear mother, my dear mother, give me the beautiful robe that we have prepared, you and P. No further name was given. And Our Lady gave me a white dress, and the small child Jesus placed a white cloak over my shoulders, and he said to me, I want to rest on your heart and your arms. I was about to run away so as not to take him, because I am not worthy when he said to me, Stay there. I want to carry I want you to carry me. I began to cry. He dried my tears with his small hand, and there in a crib of fire, I received the holy infant Jesus. I held him in my hands, his adorable little head on my heart. While I held him, he stroked my cheeks with his delicate hands. Oh, I can just feel that. It must be amazing. He had in his right hand a golden nail and placed it like this, straight on my heart, saying, one day, this same golden nail will remain engraved where I have placed it. From the place of his nail will exude a scent, which will be the same when you come out of the tomb before the resurrection. I do not know what this means, and I did not ask him. The marvels of the scent, he said to me, will be the same during your life as after your death. In fact, from, time on, from that time on, there often came incomparable scents from that Jesus' chest, which were smelled by numerous visitors and witnesses. So, yeah, incredible. incredible. <laughs> and you mentioned those scents, scents of roses. Yes. Mm. Uh, what she didn't know, uh, and this is a, a bit of a secret with us, well, I will share with you. This is written in the book. Our Lord um, informed Marie-Julie Jeanne that the day will come when her sister who was also a very um, sweet soul you know, when she would pass away the day would come when they would exhume her body and find it incorrupt furthermore our lord promised marie julie Jenny as well that the same thing would happen to her her body would be exhumed and her body would likewise be found incorrupt thus uh, making it a sign of yet again of the authenticity and of the supernatural uh, nature of the case of marie julie Jeanne and of a life and most particularly of a message of conversion and prophecy yes. well um because i mean all these transcripts i mean when she had all these visions she didn't she had people transcribing for her or, or taking notes or what the bishop actually i think the bishop didn't allow he forbade the taking of notes by those who were there to write the word our lord's words or what can you tell us a little bit about that how did the bishop make sure ensure the integrity of the of the text of the transcripts from her ecstasies brilliant question that's very interesting and very adequate um indeed Actually, it was most of all, it all began under Monseigneur Fournier before the arrival of Lecoq. Uh, Monseigneur Fournier did ask for a proper record to be written. You know, and he forbade all the, the secretaries, you could say, all volunteers, to never to take home any notes, but to transcribe as well as possible everything they would uh, hear Marie-Julie Jeanne say. And they did. It was one particular, I think it was uh, Monsieur Charbonnier, whose handwriting I could not decipher if my life depended on it. I mean, the man, I suspect, had uh, one courvoisier too many, but he was writing all the time I, gibberish. I couldn't understand. But the, the immense majority of all these writings were perfectly le uh, readable. Uh, and But nobody, it was very specific. There was always a priest or a Dr. Ambert who was there to make sure no one was allowed to take away with them any copies of the messages themselves or of the events that they witnessed. Nonetheless, uh, by memory, a lot of these messages were echoed and repeated throughout the country for many, many, many years. But it was dangerous because whenever you repeat or copy even a message, and this I know firsthand, if you, hold, you have a huge responsibility. When I started this book, my, mon Dieu, I was terrified. I, how many prayers have I 
sent to God asking him to forgive me in advance for any mistakes or errors I might have committed, even in the translation from French to English. Sometimes it's very, you can't even always translate literally because it makes no sense. So you have to translate the spirit of the idea with all the words. And the responsibility is huge. I placed myself at the feet of the cross, like I'm sure the immense majority of these transcribers did. You know? But what else can you do? God is merciful and he knows our hearts. So, indeed, uh, they did this when Monseigneur Le Fournier passed away and Le Coq took over. He, was, he didn't have the authority. He could not forbid people to go into somebody's home and to write notes. That's, he, no one had that, that kind of authority. France has never been uh, a dictatorship of this, of this sort. So the notes continued and proceeded on forth um, until, even remarkably enough, uh, just in 1938, before World War II, you know, World War II began, according to French history, on September the 1st, 1939. Actually, on the 3rd, September the 3rd. That was when France declared war on Germany. After that, on September 1st, 1939, Germany uh, threw all its, its uh, armor divisions in Poland, uh, supported by the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force. So a year earlier, our Lord told Marie-Julie Jani to tell the principal um, transcriber of the messages and of her life, the famous uh, Marquis de la Francrie, who was a remarkable Catholic. Uh, he used to go back and forth and in Rome. He had many contacts, including with the Holy Father. And the message given to him was this. Uh, uh, tell my son to take all the documents uh, that uh, witness uh, your case, your experiences with heaven, and to hide them. For the day will come when Germany will reach these areas of France and uh, will occupy the country for so many years. Now, in 1938, uh, the war was not declared yet. France, at the time, was considered the first military power in the world, even above Russia, above Germany. The Germans were redoing, remaking their muscles little by little, but France had the largest amount of divisions in the world, more than any other country, even the largest air force with very good planes, excellent tanks. The message was unrealistic, very much like in Fatima, when they said that Russia would spread her errors. In 1917, in Fatima, uh, Russia was on its knees. It lost the war. It signed an armistice with the Kaiser. It was finished. Same thing happened with Marie-Julie Jeannie. The message was not realistic, but the Marquis de la Francrie, alarmed, believed believed that there would be a war with Germany. At the time, it was there was almost no doubt. It's very much like now between Ukraine and Russia and what the few immediate future holds. Very much like that. And the war took place. And indeed, like Marie-Julie Jeannie was told, the French army were beaten uh, through not superior armies or superior manpower, but by superior tactics that have never been seen ever before. And so those documents were preserved saved from German, from the Nazis, from the German occupation, and after the liberation, brought forth again to light uh, after the death of Marie-Julie Jeannie. Remember, she passed away in March 1941 under German occupation. So, yes. And the messages were, our Lord was very specific about when to publish these messages. <laughs> yes. He controlled, he controlled everything. He knew, he told them when, right? Yes. Uh, our Lord said that it would be, I believe, seven months after the passing away of Marie-Julie Jeannie that the messages and the secrets would be permitted to be spread. Since 1941, since the liberation, shall we say, until today, there's been ever so few books that have been written about Marie-Julie Jeannie. Uh, the principal one uh, was uh, written originally by the Marquis de la Francrie. It was a small book uh, that covered not nearly the full content of the messages, but it was a very well-written book in French, which was translated later in English. And you can find it even today on Amazon. It covers the cornerstone of the events that took place to Marie-Julie Jeannie, some principal messages. But um, later, all the writers in France, particularly in France, wrote more about the apparitions and the messages, prophecies and the warnings and the message of conversion. Um, Originally, I started with one of those books that, were, that I bought in France. Actually, it was offered to me as a gift. Um, afterwards, uh, the granddaughter 
of the Marquis de la Franquerie, uh, whom I got in touch with, married a Frenchman, French, half French, half Belgian, I think. I don't know what it is with Belgian people. <laughs> I'm saying this to your auditors because uh, uh, Monique is uh, part uh, Belgian, from what I understand. And uh, in that event, the, this uh, lovely couple, uh, the granddaughter of the Marquis, have uh, maintained and kept the house of Marie-Julie Jani under their auspices, under their guards, for a very, very long time. And they, to this day, uh, continue, continue to propagate the messages that uh, heaven has uh, bestowed upon my through my religion. They even have a website which I write. I wrote about it in my book. So I do not claim, I, I'm not interested in attacking personal attention to myself. Really don't. The only thing that it really interests me is to be able, uh, through a means, to say merci to God for a wonderful brother. I should say two brothers. I have two brothers. One is called Teddy, the other Philippe. Um, and I had a wonderful family all together. And um, for me, this book was the only expression that uh, my imagination could think of um, to say merci. And this book, this echo, I am um, very ever so in such a limited manner wrote was to do just that, to echo a message of God uh, to humanity. Uh, to give to my fellow Catholics, to my compatriots, uh, all the tools that were meant for you to have, and which, for reasons that are less than honorable, have been hidden from you purposely. And I'm not just referring that those of Marie-Julie Jeanne, but of others, Fatima being but the most obvious, La Salette, unquestionably, and others. No? Um, so that was the... Yes, our Lord said that the time would come when these messages will be published, that uh, there will be no interference permitted, and that the time will come when those chosen, particular the expression was, those chosen families will be chosen to receive this message in their heart and to act accordingly, and therefore to be protected for what is yet to come. Which, is, as you will see, most likely next week, I'm afraid it's hair-raising. It is. It's incredible. Well, um, Zagi, to conclude this episode, we're, I'm going to ask you to relate. There's a message that our Lord gave to those who are who would be skeptics of these messages. In fact, he didn't speak just of these, but in mess of, of messages in general. And what did the Lord say about it? Yes. There is a particular message where our Lord says that we are not to condemn those who do not believe or find the, the message very difficult to digest. But she, at the same time, God has mercy for those because it's indeed difficult to accept. Notwithstanding, our Lord asked those who doubt not to judge so quickly, not to condemn, not to say, no, I don't think so. But to take the time to review, to study, to meditate on this particular message through Marie-Julie Janie. It has not been formally approved by the Catholic Church. It is true. But it has been informally approved in writing by one of its bishops, Monsignor Fournier. When Bishop Lecoq took over and prohibited poor Marie Julie Jani, who was guilty of the unforgivable crime to adore Christ too much, uh, when he prohibited the worst of, I would say, uh, punishments to, not to receive the Eucharist, she was restituted that right through divine providence and through the intercession of Dr. Humbert and other priests who went all the way to Rome asking uh, for Pope Leo XIII to reinstitute once more the giving of the Eucharist. And remarkably enough, she was even sponsored by yet another Pope, Pius mm -hmm. XII, who before becoming a Pope um, went to meet with Marie-Julie Jeannie in a pilgrimage she did when I think he was still a cardinal. He met me. She was becoming quite famous for her piety and who totally supported her, gave her her paternal blessing and supported her. And I suspect was hoping to see the case being brought forward to the dicasterium of the doctrine of the faith. It hasn't been done so yet. However, one can say with pride and gratefulness 
that the dossier of Marie Julie Jani has been supported indirectly, informally, not just by Bishop Fournier, the local Bishop of Nantes, but by His Holiness Leo XIII and Pius XII. That's quite remarkable. Well, Xavier, I can't thank you enough for another amazing episode. Thank you so much for all this information. I'd like to remind our viewers that Xavier wrote this amazing book. You can you can read all about it in this book. It's an anthology. It's a heavy, thick book. It's well worth it. And it's called Revelations, The Hidden Secret Messages and Prophecies of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So we're going to be going through this book step by step. I encourage you to, to get it. I think you can get it on our website and you, or you can get it on Amazon. Well worth the read. It should, every family should have this copy of the book. And if you, you know, it's, it's not like any other book that you've read about messages. He has the secrets that nobody else knows about what was hidden in the Vatican archives. And so I'm so grateful, Debbie, that you can share these with us. We are so uh, privileged to, to, to receive them directly from you. So. Thank you so much. And I encourage, so um, to, to conclude, I'd like to maybe, I forgot to say the St. Michael prayer to begin. I'm so sorry. But um, yeah, that's a biggie. But tonight we'll, we'll conclude though with a prayer I think that would be appropriate, a prayer for the intercession uh, and the edification of Marie Julie Jaime. So if you'd like to um, pray with me, let's, let's finish with this. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. O little sister, Marie-Julie, thou whose admirable goodness did not cease here below to be compassionate towards our miseries and to console our griefs, thou whose untirable charity welcomes all our requests and makes us all hope in the goodness of God. Now that thou art close to thy good mother of heaven, listen again to our prayers and ask her to draw from us in the all open great heart of her son, the adorable treasures that she has made thee catch a glimpse of. O divine heart of Jesus, heart of love and infinite mercy. O immaculate heart, sweet maternal heart of Mary. Thou who art but one same heart and whose richness is inexhaustible, grant us, we beseech thee, all the graces of which we have need by the intercession of the loving soul of Marie-Julie, who knew how to pray to thee so well that thou could not refuse her anything, and accomplish, O oh, all-powerful God, that we may soon invoke her for the conversion of sinners, the triumph of the Holy Church, and peace in the world under the title Blessed, that she appears to have so well merited by her love of souls and her love of the cross. Amen. Amen. Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Have a blessed evening, everyone, and we will see you next time when we discuss the prophecies, especially the end times prophecies yes. of Matthew Jane. Thank you again, Vicky. God bless you, everyone. Good night. God bless you.